This black swan event of our generation has accelerated the digital transformation of all industries, including the public sector. Firstly, a big thank you to all essential workers globally, from healthcare professionals to first responders to those maintaining ICT infrastructure, including some of my Huawei colleagues, and to even the delivery workers. As we have witnessed the recent resurfacing of COVID cases in some countries, we are reminded that no one is safe until everyone is safe, or at least when commercial vaccine is available. This means the way we have been living, playing, learning and working for the past few months may continue for another one year or so. We need to get used to these trusted bubbles that we are in, either by choice or required by law. The UK just recently banned social gathering of more than six people. I just met a school principal here in Singapore. We agreed moving forward on the need for hybrid learning, where classes will have students both on-site and online. A challenge is to ensure the integrity of online examination. Those of us back to office to work are likely to be grouped into Team A and Team B with no physical contact between the teams. Unfortunately, sometimes a bubble may burst with a person in our trusted group being infected by the virus. We then need to move to another bubble or create a new one. This is why it is not just about doing things from home, but from anywhere. This means a robust ICT infrastructure is very critical. We heard of countries planning to ration internet bandwidth to cater to all these increased activities at home or even on mobile. I count myself lucky with the fiber 1 Gbps connection at home in Singapore. Huawei was part of this next generation nationwide broadband network. We will see trusted bubbles across industries, providing end-to-end -end and one-stop services. The beautiful Maldives recently opened up to receive tourists with better social distancing measures, such as operating the various resort islands as bubbles. There are areas that do not have full end-to-end -end supply chain and services. We still need to work with external partners. A few months ago, China and Singapore opened up a green lane for essential business travelers. While there is no quarantine for the travelers, very stringent checks are in place to assure their health status. What are the positive social, economic and wider impacts? Saying COVID has accelerated e-commerce is an understatement. There's also a rush to adopt cashless payment to support e-commerce and more importantly, to reduce physical contact. I spent 75% of my time on the road in the last 20 years. Having grounded for the last few months got me thinking, maybe some on-site activities can be conducted online. But social contact for human is still important. Travel will rebound, but gradually. A major impact is an office space. Earlier this year, Fujitsu announced that by 2022, they will reduce the office space by 50% since more staff are working from home. On a related note, specialists can be in different bubbles or locations with end-to-end -end supply chain in the vicinity. More workflow, service and even manufacturing automations to increase efficiency and reduce physical contact. It is a norm now for us to have physical distancing while on public transport or at the restaurant. But this spa space requirement will increase the cost of our operation. This is why we may see food court fine dining. At the food court of major buildings, small food stores share the dining area. The same arrangement can be extended to higher end restaurants, even with a common pool of servers. Some shopping will become hybrid with more online options and one short visit to the physical location for the final inspection. Even buying houses have gone online with the use of VR. High unemployment tops the negative impact by this pandemic, which will unfortunately widen the wealth gap. Such class gaps and various COVID-related enforcements resulted in cases of social unrest in some part of the world. Illegal immigration is likely to rise when people want to seek better medical services or employment opportunities. Family violence is likely to increase with more people staying at home longer. Economic downturn will push up crimes, especially cybercrime and online scam, since many activities are going digital. When people are desperate for treatment and vaccination, 
organized crime will be too eager to create fake drugs. The impact on industries such as tourism will be long lasting. The society and government need to work together to retrain and upgrade the affected workforce. Earlier this year, staff from Singapore Airlines and hotels were retrained and redeployed to support the fight against COVID. Some countries have been planning to move their capital cities because of very high population density. This pandemic is surely a top consideration now for such long-term planning. We may also see smaller self-contained cities, such as the plan for La Ville du Credeur in Paris, a 15-minute city where you can conduct essential activities within 15 minutes of commute. Investment in safe and innovation urban transportation will increase. Business Continuity Management, or BCM, will be a top consideration. Many cities had shortage of essential medical supplies and masks because they outsourced their production elsewhere. Policies were changed to bring back such manufacturing and even on the sustainable supply of food. Singapore is looking at urban farming now, even using the rooftop of many high-rise buildings. Likewise, the over-dependence on foreign professionals in the essential services has to be re-examined. We heard of story, country threatening to stop its medical professionals from leaving to work in the neighboring country. Cloud computing is getting very popular, but the infrastructure and more importantly, the data must be treated as a country's strategic resource too. We need to look at the BCM of cloud, specifically the introduction of sovereign cloud such as Gaia X of the European Union. I will elaborate more on this topic later. This pandemic is the catalyst for the public sector to evolve and even transform. Let's start by looking at the governance and internal operations. The top priority now must be looking after the safety and well-being of the public servants, with many of them performing essential services. Maybe redesigning of the work groups and workplace, including the use of technologies to detect threats early. The public sector too has to allow decentralization of the workforce and enabling them to work from anywhere. Do we really need huge city operation center, especially with today's broadband connectivity and 5G? The public sector has strict governance and process in adopting innovation, but this is a period of VUCA, of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. We need to support more public-private joint agile innovation for us to overcome this pandemic and economic downturn. Beyond video conferencing, the public sector can adopt more technologies brought about by 5G, cloud and AI to improve collaboration, such as AR, VR, immersive reality, full multimedia user interface, and even robotics. Automation can increase efficiency and reduce physical contacts. The momentum to break down silos within the public sector has to speed up. A top-down approach is needed for more secure information exchange. This also calls for a government-wide data strategy because data is the new currency now. I will revisit this topic later. The public sector is all about public services. This pandemic is providing many reasons and even the urgency for the digital transformation of some of these services. Let me give you some examples. Usually by regulations, a citizen or business has to transact with the different public sector agencies as part of the process before realizing the final objective. Quite often, that may mean visiting agencies A, B, and C separately, whether on-site or online. We need to reduce such multiple contacts, especially those involving physical transaction. There's an urgent need to move away from agency-centric to the user-centric model. There are two technological considerations here. Firstly, a public sector-wide enabling platform, a platform to connect up the different systems and databases across the public sector agencies so that we can provide a true one-stop service to the user. One example is the Saudi government service pass. Secondly, a public sector app store, just like those apps store on our mobile device. Different agencies may require similar applications. Why not have this store for the sharing of apps? We can invite businesses and even individuals 
to build such apps. India has a plan for such e-government app store. It goes without saying, going online is not enough. Public sector agencies have to go mobile too during this era of doing things from anywhere. As said earlier, many transactions with the public sector are mandated by regulations. It means many of these processes can be automated using AI. An added benefit is consistency in delivering services to the people and businesses. In any society, there will still be people with limited access to digital services. There is a need for one-stop service center for them to go to for physical transactions. These centers can also be educational centers to promote the use of technology. At least at the city level, it is critical for business continuity management and monitoring of essential supplies, services, and personnel. Top decision makers need to make cross-agency decisions based on such data. With companies going bankrupt and increasing unemployment, grassroots economy becomes even more important. Individuals and small businesses must be encouraged to produce more goods and services. The public sector has a role to play by digitally enabling such small businesses. Their collaboration and connecting the supply and demand. I call this the small business enabling platform. Be it big enterprises or small businesses and even public sector transactions, we do need a cashless society, probably with multiple online payment providers. Another critical component of digital transformation is a non-fragmented and standard electronic identity. While it may be managed commercially, the public sector has to be the driver behind such national electronic ID for people, enterprises and agencies to trust and transact with one another. Blockchain technology seems promising in this area. Estonia has national electronic ID for many years, but they even introduced an e-residency initiative. A foreigner, even one that is not in Estonia, can sign up to be an electronic resident. With this e-residency, you can transact with individuals and companies in Estonia, a true digital transformation where the mission behind electronic identity is enhanced and new services created to increase the competitiveness of the country. My last example is this public sector business enabling platform. As said earlier, our transactions with the public sector are usually part of the mandated process before realizing our final objective. For example, to drive a car. I have to pass the highway code, learn to drive, pass the driving test, buy a car, register the car, pay the road tax, maintain the car, and so on, involving different public sector agency and businesses. How nice if there's a true one-stop platform bringing all these services together. Although I gave you a few examples, you may ask what exactly this digital transformation of public services is. Let me group them into three areas. Firstly, it is to improve efficiency of current services. For example, amending the law, allowing online reporting of non-injury traffic accident. Secondly, introducing new services under the current mission. Take Ministry of Education as an example. His mission is typically to develop individuals to their full potential to fulfill the demands of the country. With the data it already possesses, the ministry can offer new services such as job matching and placement. Last but not least, enhancing the mission and offering new services such as the e-residency of Estonia. For this to happen, silo problems in the public sector have to be resolved and usually with a top-down efforts. Digital transformation is not just about digitalization, connectivity, going online, cost reduction, or improve the ROI. Digital transformation has to involve a lot more, such as redefining the mission, organization, governance, process, and skill sets. The public sector covers widely, and it is complex with many industries, such as customs, education, healthcare, and city security. But when it comes to the digital of digital transformation, there are five common data entities that public sector agencies need to manage. People, objects, locations, events, and organizations. With different mission, organization, governance, and process, 
different public sector agencies have to manage different entities and their corresponding data. Take customs as an example. People include the driver of the truck. Objects include the container and the goods. Locations include the port of origin. Events include the time the ship arrives. And organizations include the exporter and importer. To manage these five entities, public sector agencies require a set of operational capabilities which involve more than the use of technologies. Firstly, we have sensing or data collection. It can be via a conversation, online form filling, electronic submission, or even sensors, including cameras. Secondly, we need to communicate the data collected. It can be human to human, human to machine, and machine to machine. Thirdly, collaboration is necessary to derive true values from digital transformation. From the examples shared earlier, collaboration can be between public sector agency and agency, public sector and businesses, and even with the people. The Singapore Civil Defence Force uses the My Responder platform to mobilise the public to help in cardiac arrest and minor fire before the first responders arrive. Fourthly, while sensing is collecting raw data, sense making provides answers to questions such as who, what, when, where, how, and why, and even provides forecast and prediction. From technology perspective, these operational capabilities requires big data analytics and AI. Last but not least, decision making. It can be as simple as dispatching a maintenance crew to repair the street light, or as complex as mobilizing thousands of people and equipment to build a temporary hospital to house COVID patients in the shortest time possible. It may also mean enacting new laws and very importantly, allocating budget and resources. For digital transformation to be successful, the public sector requires the right laws and regulations to support the redefined mission, organization, governance and process. Strong governance structure and leadership are needed to pull the agencies and public servants in the same direction. Digital transformation is all about data. Upholding privacy and cybersecurity must not be neglected. Public sector serves and even collaborates with the people and businesses. Trust is everything. Last but not least, budget and the operating model. Is the effort going to be based on capital expense, operating expense, or even as a cloud model? Digital transformation is not one off. It has to be a journey. A very important critical success factor for digital transformation is technology. Let me start with some products and solutions to enable the operational capabilities. Smart devices, from a mobile phone to a smart watch, to special emergency radio system, body-worn camera, and even Huawei software-defined camera. They are all to support sensing and even communicating. Next, intelligent connectivity to support communicating and collaborating operational capabilities. It is not just about fiber optics, but also 5G, Wi-Fi 6 and beyond. Today's data networking is already very complex and the load has also increased tremendously because of the need to conduct various activities from anywhere. There's a need for intelligent routing capabilities such as Huawei's IDN, Intent Driven Network, to ensure the right device has the right bandwidth at the right time. Collaborating, sense-making and decision-making require ubiquitous computing, including server, storage, modular data center, and even power supply. These three operational capabilities also call for inclusive AI, where everyone and everything can leverage the power of AI. Huawei offers a full-stack, all-scenario AI platform from the Ascend AI processors to the MySpore framework with independent machine learning libraries and to the Model Arts pre-integrated end-to-end services for application enablement. To maximize the value of AI, we need to integrate applications, data, businesses, clouds, and devices. We do this through Huawei's Roma platform. In the fight against COVID with the ICT BCM challenges, the importance of universal cloud becomes even more obvious. In the last few months, many healthcare providers around the world took advantage 
of an AI-assisted CT scan analysis readily available on Huawei Cloud to identify COVID patients. The previous manual method took 14 minutes per patient, and it is now reduced to 2.5 minutes with AI on cloud. One particular product stood out in living through COVID is the Idea Hub. It is a multi-sensing, multimedia, and multi-applications collaborative platform with high-definition video conferencing. It has its own applications gallery and support third-party applications. Lastly, we have public sector ICT solution to support industry digital transformation. Some of Huawei's public sector solutions include Converge Operation Center, e-government, intelligent traffic management, digital tax, smart customs, smart education, and smart healthcare. We will share with you more on these solutions in separate sessions. The other aspect of technology is from the strategies and architecture perspective. Earlier, I already spoke on the importance of National Electronic ID, the public sector app store, and the various enabling platforms. There are other considerations as well. From bottom up, the government-wide data strategy I mentioned earlier. Embarking on this digital transformation, the agencies and even the whole public sector need to strategize on the data. What are the elements of the five entities for the different use cases? What data do we need? Where can we get the data? Do we have the legal authority to assess the data? Do we have the budget? How do we take care of the privacy, security, and even disposal of the data? We need also a national or city ICT infrastructure. This pandemic has shown the world the importance of such ICT infrastructure. It has to be a top priority for any country, including offering affordable internet access. The Mexican government has been planning for the Internet Para Todos, meaning Internet for All program, to make sure internet can be accessed by as many people as possible at an affordable cost. Finally, National Sovereign Cloud, which I will spend more time to explain next. Most will agree that the public sector needs cloud too, but do you know why? Firstly, budgeting cycle is moving more ICT investment towards OPEX or anything as a service model. Traditionally, public sector agencies plan and call tenders for different systems using independent server storage, databases, applications, etc. There was no sharing of resources. Many public services are mission critical and even life critical, with some requiring 24 by 7 by 365 availability. Pooling and virtualizing resources in a cloud can better support such high availability. Whether it is nearing a tax filing deadline or more demand on the clinical information system because of a pandemic, a standalone system will not meet such surge in demand. A cloud platform is also more conducive for information sharing. With the layers and choices and life cycle of ICT products, it is best for the public sector to leave the complex integration to professional cloud providers. There's also a risk of lock-in by software and hardware vendors for self-built system. A cloud platform supporting different businesses, services, and databases offers agility in developing new services, such as the urgent need for contact tracing service during this pandemic. The public sector has to compete against the private sector to keep the best ICT talents. The move from running own data centers to using cloud services becomes more attractive. When operating own ICT, especially during a pandemic, public sector agencies have to manage BCM issues too, from supplies to people. A global analyst, Canalis, just issued a report that China cloud services market in Q2 this year has surged by 70% year on year due to the COVID response and the government stimulus. Now that we understand why the public sector needs cloud, let's take a look at the move towards sovereign cloud. The public sector is rightly very concerned about the security of third-party cloud, the privacy of the data, the data sovereignty, and even the cloud providers BCM challenges. Data is the new currency. It has to be protected as a country's strategic resource. Governments have to safeguard the integrity, confidentiality, availability, and control of data. Digital sovereignty 
is a matter of national security. What are the characteristics of sovereign cloud? The infrastructure and data must be within the jurisdiction. There's ownership and control of the data. Data crossing border is not avoidable. We need close monitoring and management of such data flow. We need in place all the privacy measures and gain the trust from all stakeholders. Last but not least, local skills and capabilities to build, operate, and maintain sovereign cloud. Let me share with you some sovereign cloud examples. Firstly, the African Union, through the Smart Africa Alliance, aims to ensure the sovereignty of data of all the African countries. They are developing standards and certifications on the public cloud and private cloud, and even on the compute nodes, storage nodes, network nodes, and endpoints. Some of the key principles behind EU's Gaia-X include digital sovereignty and self-determination, free market access, and European value creation. Saudi has been pushing his cloud-first policy. As part of this initiative, the Saudi government has enhanced its cloud computing regulatory framework. It requires all hosting and storage of data to be in the country. And of course, there will be restriction on cross-border transfer of certain types of data. The Thailand government this year approved $146 million to build a government data center and cloud to ensure the safe and secure use of data and its availability during crisis. National sovereign cloud does not just refer to government use. It can include consumer cloud where you and I have been using on our smartphone. There's also enterprise cloud for businesses. As for government cloud, there are generally three types. Security cloud for secret information requiring very high security, including the physical security for the facility and infrastructure. The day-to-day -day operational cloud for back office system and various enabling platforms I said earlier. Last but not least, the public service cloud, where citizens, visitors, and businesses transact with the public sector. Huawei cloud is modular and flexible enough to meet your various requirements. Reach out to see to us to see how we can help you. I've come to the end of my sharing session. I hope it has been useful as you embark on your digital transformation initiatives. And I'm confident Huawei can be your strategic partner for this journey. Please take care during this challenging time. Thank you very much. Our world is more and more digital. Not only in our daily lives, at home or at work, also the public sector embarked on a digital journey and are looking into digital solutions. However, we cannot solve tomorrow's problems with technologies of today, because these have been developed with the requirements of yesterday, or half day. My name is Edwin Diender. I'm Chief Digital Transformation Officer in our Enterprise Business Group, and welcome to our session on solutions for the digital journey of the public sector. It's my honor to introduce you a range of solutions that actually have been developed and are available today. And not only with tomorrow in mind, but also the days thereafter. Digital drives transformation in the public sector without a doubt. As said before, the digital world has arrived. We shop online. We learn and watch movies online. We listen to music. We find answers to almost any question, all online. In such a world, not only we as people, but also companies and enterprises have changed their internal structures. They've rearranged their business process and the way they bring their services to our lives and at work. We're the customers, right? So customers first. This is a people or a customer oriented concept. Adopting a people or a customer's oriented concept is what we see more and more as a digital initiative in public sector. Therefore, digital will drive this journey and will help move the public sector higher up the value chain in a much shorter time frame. And that brings me to the value of the industry itself and the value towards partners. The whole is more than the sum of its parts, a common meme. No one works on their own or siloed and excluded anymore. Digital is a game of partners and partnerships. 
So one of the things we've incorporated into our solution framework is to work with global partners and to co-develop and launch solutions in domains like traffic management, critical communications, customs, taxation, healthcare, education, and what have you. These solutions integrate public services with digital tooling such as cloud computing, big data analytics, AI, and intent-driven networks, IDNs. For example, to improve the work efficiency and daily operations within the public sector. And that brings value to the industry. Solutions that bring value to the industry. Solutions are nowhere if they are not unique and have no value. So what are some values in our solution stack? Well, firstly, they are built with off-the-shelf, commercially available, mature products. And these products all have unique values themselves. From the smallest item in your smartphone to the largest chunk in a huge computing room or a data center and anything in between. For example, each separate component, each item, performs above industry standard. And this is not me being enthusiastic about the organization I represent. This is validated by third-party testing authorities. In fact, if you follow the news a bit, you will agree with me that our products are one of the best tested products out there. Another value that's rather unique is we are the lowest on power consumption on each item in our portfolio. And we're built on global and open standards. So nothing to migrate, nothing to replace and no forklift upgrades, but a horizontal layer to overlay and bridge each individual information silo with a focus on integration, interoperability and coexistence. And that's rather unique and surely very valuable. So let's have a look at what these solutions are. This is a snapshot, a panoramic view, if you like, of our solutions. One platform, one comprehensive technology stack, a horizontal layer of converged technology with features and functionalities and capabilities that all can be optimized in such a way that it best fits, for example, transportation, or healthcare, or e-government, or education, and what have you. And they all work together in the best way possible. If you look at this chart, you see different pieces, each of them a square representing a solution domain. But you can also look at them in a slightly other way. Each square could also be a cube in a 3D model, right? And a cube has pieces. Pieces are building blocks. Our solution stack have solutions that are like building blocks. Similar to pieces of a Rubik's Cube, which are part of a universal structure and which each in, in which each piece can move independently without breaking that structure. That is the value and rather unique to our solution stack. So let's have a look at a couple of these solutions. Firstly, an operations center. Acting as a brain, the operations center plays a pivotal role in daily activities of city life, as well as its emergency response capabilities and the efficiency in decision making. With increasing economic prosperity, people expect more from their city management. And really, only smooth operations can help national and city administrators be more efficient in their daily operations, which is exactly what a national operations center provides. And that brings me to the ruling and the policies around it, a digital version of governance for an e-government, building a unified connected platform to serve the ICT requirements of the public sector. We need strong hands and solutions to keep it all together. And in this analogy, network and cloud are two hands of the same body, if you like, working together and interacting in perfect harmony. The network is the baseline to secure and carry our services, and cloud to embrace and guarantee ubiquitous access. Together, a strong foundation for the digital journey of the public sector. Another example, intelligent traffic management. We all aware that cities are getting more and more congested. If we only look at traffic, so not people, not bicycles, not people going in and out buildings, cars on a road, traffic. The World Health Organization, WHO, estimates that approximately 1.35 million people already are killed every year as a direct result of poor traffic and road management. 
projecting a 3% cost of gross domestic product. So today, road traffic and the killing of people projects a 3% cost, has a negative impact on a gross domestic product. Urban traffic managers are in urgent need of new ICT to improve road safety and to be more efficient in the daily operations of traffic flows alongside dealing with violations. Empowered by new technologies such as AI, big data, cloud computing and 5G, our recently launched intelligent traffic management solution provides traffic management with a 2020 vision, if you like, and a powerful brain. Combined with simplified operations and maintenance, o and we're able to help transportation departments build an ICT-enabled urban road development to reduce cost and to prevent further loss of lives. Taxation. Tax is a vital source of revenue for the public sector. The World Bank classifies countries as financially risky if their tax to gross domestic product ratio is below 15%. And yet today, tax departments worldwide are still facing an array of challenges. Poor supervision, overly complex taxpayer services and capabilities for quick responses and decision making are weak to say the least. Combining powerful, simplified and intelligent network connectivity with full stack, secure and reliable hybrid cloud, intelligent computing and intelligent data storage, our digital tax solution digitalizes core services provides transactional invoices and intelligent tax responses for a smooth process of decision making. And as a result, it reduces tax administration costs, it improves tax collection ability, and it expands the tax base and therefore improves service quality. Basically, we're helping the public sector to increase tax revenue and improve the overall operation of taxation and tax collection. And that brings me to customs. Trade. Several developing areas become an increasingly important trade hub for the region they are part of, both on import and in export. Local entities are reaping enormous value from digitizing customs operations as efficiencies improve and employees are empowered across the value chain. Smart customs operations are currently playing a decisive role in optimizing duty collection and thereby boost national revenues. Digital customs programs help reduce bottlenecks where space, offloading facilities and other port resources are scarce. In many instances, this is done while upskilling personnel and increasing their productivity and value within the customs agency. We have supported local and regional eco-partners to reap the benefit of this new wave of innovation within taxation. And that brings me to another domain, education. Information technology, IT, in education is not just about digitization, storage, computing and networks. IT, information technology, is about conveying information, knowledge. We're committed to smart education, bridging the digital divide, equalize educational opportunities and help improve quality of teaching and education. With the advent of online learning, Education is no longer chained to the traditional classroom and our solutions connect and foster collaboration between teachers, students and parents and school administrators, regardless of their time zone or geography. And as new educational opportunities arise and very cost effective in an era of exploding intuition fees, we're committed to bring your education and to be your education solution partner. It's not for nothing that we say we lead the road to digital transformation, to smart education. Healthcare. Smart healthcare. ICT is reinventing healthcare from fully connected e-hospitals that can deliver services to more and more people to integrated regional network that help reduce cost, cut errors and improve a service quality. Our fully connected healthcare solutions provide medical professionals and organizations with the collaborative infrastructure that they need to securely share and process and use healthcare data with the potential to improve patients' outcome. 
Advanced people-oriented medical services solutions use a variety of telemedicine application to enable clinical collaboration, teleconsult, remote surgical demonstration, medical video on demand, and remote doctor's visits. On the network side, an agile network for e-hospital. Virtualization, software defined networking, and wireless technologies will help these networks run 24 seven while maintaining both in-hospital and remote medical service availability. Operations and maintenance are simplified, while security is also significantly improved to cope with new borderless networks. In short, multi-channel HD telehealth and clinical collaboration provide a complete end-to-end -end clinical collaboration solution that integrates remote medical video consultation, specialized medical devices, and enterprise software development kits to integrate these interfaces and provide medical service platforms on mobile and fixed networks. And that brings me to almost the end of my session. This is not a one-off. We're not a business department that started yesterday. We got a strong footprint worldwide of a business practice in the public sector. Cooperate and guide technological innovation to transform the public sector is what drives us. And we've already done that and we're doing that in already more than 100 countries. So, to tie it all together. We're more and more in a digital world. However, we cannot solve tomorrow's problems with technologies of today because these have been developed with the requirements of yesterday. Or have they? I hope I was able to clarify our solutions that have been developed and are built with off-the-shelf, commercially available, mature products. Developed not only with tomorrow in mind, but also with the days long after. Thank you.